Relatively small in some ways, like finding a really expansive discussion of that is relatively small. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, now I have to do something. to see if the, uh, when you yep. look at the screen, whether, um, maybe we need does it to capture me, the entire person? Yes. I think because you're taller than me, so. Yeah, I think that's a good setting. We can see that. Yeah. Way. Yeah. So. Should, if I stand here, or should I stand here? No, I think that's fine. Yeah, it's actually live right now. So. Oh, great. There we go. Huh. <laughs> Hi, Internet. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Lucy, do you want to? So I just, yeah, you can start. It would be great. Oh. you want me to do? Hang out over here. Yeah, because I want to introduce you. Okay. All right. Hi, okay. <laughs> everyone. Welcome to um, Lacoste Game Gallery. And um, we are having a special talk on the late Danish artist Nina Hole. I don't know if it's name, but Craig will correct, uh, will, will do a better job. Uh, mm -hmm. My artist, Craig Hartenberger. Before we start, I just want to say um, we are uh, Lacoste King Gallery uh, formed uh, in May uh, by myself, Lysan King, and Lucy Lacoste. Come here. <laughs> yes, come into the camera. Okay, where do you want me to be? Yeah. Oh, God, not yeah. the right one. Yeah. You get the right one. Right. Yeah. Let me get You guys, you get the yeah. right I'm more comfortable. Okay, okay, thank you. So, um, yeah. <laughs> the uh, Lacoste um, Gallery was formed by you. Right. Founded by you, right. 28 years ago, uh, right. showing many, many interesting um, ceramic work, uh, ceramic art, uh, and also showcased many, many important artists, including mm -hmm. Nina Holland. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And very, very mm -hmm. uh, fortunate this year, well, sometime May, June, we, mm -hmm. Lacoste Keen Gallery, had the opportunity to be appointed the exclusive um, representative, um, gallery yes. rep representative. Um, in this country mm -hmm. for the next two years. Mm -hmm. So uh, as part of maybe our longer. Maybe longer. Yeah, maybe <laughs> yes. Oh here comes Jenny. Oh, so good. maybe yeah we just started. Oh, Come on in. Yeah. Yeah. We get, I just want them to have seats. I'm so glad you're here. As anywhere. part of our uh, you know um, mission and, and also responsibility uh, in representing Mina Hole, we uh, have put on this uh, event um, to educate everyone, the public, and you know, I know, and we know a lot of people know about uh, Nina Hole, especially in the ceramic uh, field and community. But you know, we want to reach out to uh, every corner of the world. That's why we are doing this uh, live uh, broadcast on Facebook uh, to benefit everyone and also to just kind of say hello. You know? Yeah, and I would just say, as part of Lacoste Gallery, one of the big missions always was education. That's right. Yeah. We kind of went along yeah. with our sign and we. It, and this yep. is continued exactly by yeah. Lacoste. Yeah, and so I'm glad yeah. you're taking that up. That's wonderful. Yeah. So um, <laughs> now we are now going to introduce Craig Hartenberger. Um, he's a young artist, handsome young artist, um, <laughs> <Wow>. currently do, <laughs> uh, doing his uh, MFA at uh, Kent State University, um, and uh, he is he, he was very very involved with Nina Hole because he was the uh, assistant to. Uh, one of the assistants, that, uh, and you lived there in Denmark. Um, no, never like full no. time. Yeah, you were there. You were involved, yeah, and for like four years. Yeah, so I worked yeah. in for four yeah. years. Yeah, you also spent a lot of time in Europe. You also did yeah. some stint in Sweden. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I've been to Denmark, I think, every year for the last six years. He speaks Danish. You speak Danish. A little, no, yeah. And enough. He, uh, not enough. You to are the representative of her estate. Yes. Over here. Yep. Us. Yeah. So yeah. you are our conduit, our yeah. our contact. I mean, we're her U.S. gallery. Yeah, we really That's right. Yeah. That. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we are very honored and very um, excited to have him today to uh, present to you all uh, the live and works of Nina Hale. And I will leave the explanation and all the you know the uh, um, the talk uh, about her to you. 
the introduction to you because sure. I think you can uh, talk about her much, much better than we can. Sure. So with, uh, without sure. much ado, uh, uh, please Thank you. welcome uh, Mr. Hartenberger. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so if it's okay with you guys, I think I'll sit for the duration of this, if that's fine. Um, so first off, thank you guys for coming. It's lovely to see some lovely faces in this room. Uh, thank you, Lucy and Lysun, for having me here um, and really allowing this chance to share Nina's work um, and a little bit about who she was and the impact that she had on a lot of people still working in the field. Um, yeah, it, her impact was quite far ranging um, and she really found it important to be out in the world so this is nice to carry on that aspect of what was so important to her um, so let's begin um, and you guys I think we have a tame enough group here that if there's anything that you want to know if there's a question or a clarification that I can provide during this we don't have to wait till the end for questions just respectfully bop in and I'll do my best to explain what I need to do um, so Nina, Nina was born in an area of Denmark called Jutland. Um, so Denmark is a series of islands, but there is a portion of the country that's connected to the European continent. So she was born further up in that portion of Denmark that's connected to the European continent. Um, pretty traditional family. Her father was a doctor, um, and that was that was kind of what was expected of her to follow in a traditional way, but I think as you'll come to see throughout this, Nina was really anything but conventional in a number of ways, um, and I think her, her work and her life really showed that. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll just start in. So this is, um, I think an appropriate way to start, this is Nina and her husband Larry at their home uh, in a town called Oslev, which is really a small farming community uh, about an hour and a half away from Copenhagen again Denmark's not that big so it doesn't take that long to get anywhere <laughs> but not that far outside of Copenhagen um, to still be quite isolated so they lived in this beautiful old house um, you can see a little bit in the background there this old thatched roofing um, so I don't know Nina Nina had this pretty significant understanding of history and connection to it. And I think something as simple as living in this old house uh, it sort of relays that idea. Um, and if you guys know anything about her work or have seen any of her work here in the gallery, like the house is a pretty predominant form <laughs> throughout uh, her entire body of work, her entire career of making. Um, so I think the actual unique home that she lived in uh, probably played into some of that and into some of her thinking. And I. There's a couple other things about this photo that I think kind of belie a little bit about who Nina was and the type of person she was and the type of life she liked to live. So you see, this is like the entrance from the back of their house that heads into the kitchen. You would usually go in the back door instead of the front, so a little bit more familiar entrance into this really warm and inviting space. Um, see the bucket of, I believe those are apples there mm -hmm. out front. Um, fruit trees all over the property. It's a really lovely garden. Um, it's a space that I think in really a nice way embodied Nina and who she was. So it's very warm, very welcoming, um, and just a place where you, you would feel comfortable no matter who you were uh, coming in. And I, I think that, that that's how Nina was too, that she was very open to new people, to new ideas, really against hierarchy, um, and really open to the idea of learning from anyone, which made her such a phenomenal person to be around. Um, so Nina's husband, Larry, uh, was an architect, or is an architect, um, still living in this space in Denmark today. Uh, one of the things that he did as they were going through this house, you know, they, they knew they needed a workshop. And they wanted to, des to design a workshop in a space that worked well for them. Um, and what they ended up coming up with was this underground workshop. So the whole space was underground. You had these, sets of stairways that went down, there were four, um, two on each side, and that's how the main light entered that space. So it was really funny, uh, the first time you would go to this house and you're like, there's a workshop here, but I don't really know where, mm -hmm. you can see it from outside. 
and you would follow Nina and say, oh, let's go to the workshop. And it looks like she was, you know, you're walking to this bedroom and it looks like you're going into a closet. <laughs> she opens the door and immediately starts going down a ladder. And you're like, what is this? Where am I going? <laughs> you go down a ladder and then you pop up and you're in this like amazing workspace. Totally underground. It was great because uh, the Denmark is beautiful in the summer. Not really the most pleasant place to be in the winter. It's dark, it's cold, uh, as we here in Massachusetts know. And it was this really lovely insulated space uh, to make work. So her and her husband Larry shared this space. Um, I should say throughout this whole lecture and the way that I put this presentation together, uh, I took the lecture that Nina would always give whenever she was asked to talk and some work that we've done afterwards talking about her and put those together. So a lot of these slides, a lot of these images that you're seeing are ones that Nina picked for her own lecture and things that she would use to talk about at work. This is a slide she would always bring up uh, to talk about her husband Larry's work. So he's an architect, uh, but also big into furniture and product design, um, collapsible bikes, things like that. Uh, but a couple of his chair designs, um, still working on this type of work as well, still doing furniture design, even though he's well into his 80s. Um, so, Nina's kind of evolution, I, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, she didn't fit in. She didn't really fit in in Denmark. Denmark, uh, if you think about the art making tradition, very heavily based on design, smooth, clean lines, well thought out function. And that wasn't Nina's interest. You know, she appreciated it, she understood it, but it's not the way that she thought to express or to work with this material. Um, Though a place, though Denmark was always her home, uh, it was a place that she felt that she needed to leave at a certain point. So her husband Larry is an American. Uh, they met while he was in Copenhagen studying at the architecture school. Uh, and then a little bit of discontent with Denmark. Nina had tried to go to school, was kicked out, <laughs> oh. and then tried again and was kicked out again yeah. uh, because she just kind of couldn't follow the rules and it wasn't ever out of disrespect it wasn't ever out of trying to be a pain in the ass or anything like that it's just that she didn't really want to play by those rules and she didn't see the reason to have to view things so rigidly um, so she left Denmark and went to the States where her husband Larry was from um, and that was that was an interesting time in the States because things were just starting to open up in this country, you know, and we're moving away uh, from the time of people like hiding their glazed recipes and people are starting to work more openly. Um, a lot of the organizations that we know today that are like the big pillars within the ceramic community were being formed. Um, and so Nina kind of walked into this and it's one of those, you know, kind of chance things that she walked into things at the right time. Are we so, saying the 60s? Yeah, yeah, right around there, right? Into the 60s, 70s, yeah. Um, so she, she walked into this at really the right time, and I think for people here, you know, it's, it's this expanding world, and things are happening, and things are starting to move in these interesting ways, and then here comes this incredibly friendly, gregarious woman from Denmark with all these, like, crazy ideas, and this great energy and enthusiasm, and willing to try anything that the material could hold. So she, she fit right into that, and she immediately felt at home. Uh, and felt that she was in a place where her energy was matched and supported. And I think that support is something that she didn't feel in Denmark, uh, which was a big impetus for leaving. Um, so this is actually a photo of Nina doing just odd jobs around studios. It's kind of funny to think of the things that the artists who we now know and respect so much did. It's kind of funny to think of them like sweeping floors and doing the menial work that younger artists are all like competing to do. Um, but that that's where she was. So the, it was very interesting um, for her because she was able to meet people this way too. So again, furthering those connections, furthering the community. Um, another funny thing that Nina did, and she always talked about this, and you almost couldn't tell if she was being serious because she would always talk about like, oh, well, that time that I was in the circus, it was like, well, what, what do you mean? Um, so she was part of the Chautauqua movement, which is this educational movement going around uh, the States at that time. 
and she was part of the arts arm of this. So she would go do raccoon firing, mm -hmm. riding around on a train with this group of people, uh, any you know various and sundry characters that you would imagine <laughs> that travel around on a train and teach people things. She was, she was just right in the thick of it. Um, so she was doing recu firing, but kind of as performance, kind of as art making, but in a casual way, uh, which, which is an interesting approach to art, um, especially if you're contrasting that to more rigid structures that she was moving away from. So having this real playful, uh, experimental, exploratory view to what art making could be. And th those are themes that followed her throughout her art making career and throughout her life. So that idea of being exposed to new people, new ideas, uh, experimentation, just unabridged creativity. I mean, that, that's what she was about. And she got to express a lot of those things and build on a lot of those ideas uh, as she was riding around with the circus doing Raku. <laughs> Do you know what the, the origin of that name is? It sounds Native American. Uh, I believe that it is. Uh, there's a whole I'll Wikipedia thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, talking about a little bit more specifically about Nina's art making interests and the things that drove her work and really inspired her work. So, there's uh, a couple different, I guess, themes or bodies of work that kind of ran throughout her career. Uh, Figures and figuration were always a part of things. Um, even when she was working with the house form, she always uh, thought of the house as, as some way to describe or understand one's own ego and one's own personhood and one's own personality. So she would use the house form to explore that, but she did work more expressly with the figure. Um, so figure, the house form, boats, Denmark being a seafaring nation, makes sense, uh, and churches. Nina was always very interested in religion in a bigger sense, um, spirituality in a lot of ways. So classical references obviously coming through. Um, myth and folk and folklore were things that were very common and running through her work as well. Um, so things that images of things that inspired her. Um, so this relatively okay photo, um, there, there is better documentation of this work, but this is some of the earliest work that she was making. This is all uh, right around, I believe like the beginning of the 70s, the first half of the 70s. Uh -huh. These are raku fired figures mm -hmm. with, the uh, with the addition of these feathers and different plumes. Um, and really, you know, this, how, how can you move further away from like Danish design? Yeah. <laughs> so like this, this begins to belie like the reasons about why she didn't fit in, about why, um, why she wasn't accepted in that way. Um, so those figures eventually changed in scale a little bit. Those first figures, you know, maybe eight inches or less. These other ones moved up into like a 12, 14, 16 inch range, something like that. Um, at this point, she still relying heavily on low fire techniques. That's where a lot of her material research was, mm -hmm. raku firing um, and just other low firing. Oh, where was she living when she was making this? Um, this work is a little bit back and forth. So she was, she was working largely in the States, but she was still going back to Denmark. Um, and I was talking to you guys a little bit about this before that Nina, you know, her husband's American, pretty easy back and forth. Um, they never had intended to get married. It was fine with them to just live together and share their life together. She was coming into the States one time and <laughs> the agent or whatever was like, well, you know, like you seem to be visiting a lot for a girlfriend. Maybe you should become a wife and I'll let you back in and sent her out of the country. Oh. Yeah. Wow. So they when actually, yeah. They, when was that? When did they get married? Oh, uh, when would that have or been? Or approximately, I mean, how long was that? I, they were married, married, I believe for 40 years. Mm -hmm. a long time. So mid 70s, yeah. that would be, yeah, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, oh, so in America. Say that again? Yeah, yeah. that's a good question. Yeah. Where yeah. in the States? Where in America? Uh, she was in New York State, oh, in New largely, York State. yeah, largely in New York State. Is she connected to Chautauqua in New York State? 
Yeah, so Larry, her so husband, good. was from New York State, so that was a lot of the reason to head back to that area. Um, so one thing that has been a constant in Nina's work is this idea of fire it again, just do it again. Again, this unconventional approach to the material. So she would, all throughout her working career, you know, you, you look at something and it comes out, I think sometimes as people who work with clay, you think like, oh, this is bad, I'll just make another one, and you kind of disregard that one. She would look at something and say, oh, you know, like this needs more, add another layer, put it back in a kiln. It can be a different type of firing, different temperature, something different, uh, but really, really open to just reworking and reworking and reworking a piece uh, until the surface was right. Um, this one is interesting because the figure is obviously there, but that house form really starts to move yeah. in too. Um, so you can see you can see themes and lines of thought moving together. Another one of those figures, um, really the density of those low fire surfaces mm -hmm. um, that she was able to achieve are really quite nice. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that surface work that she did with low fire uh, informed her work as she began to work with wood firing later in her career, um, which is something that we understand is very layered, very built upon surface. It's another one of those uh, great studio shots that I discovered, it was in her studio uh, few months after she had passed away to kind of help organize and to try to begin to catalog things. Um, I found this stack of photos, these black and white 8x10s, um, that a neighbor of hers who's a photographer or someone who lived close by who's a photographer um, had taken. So there are several of these. That first image on the title slide was one of these. Um, I think there's three or four <coughs> more throughout the presentation, but I don't know. I, I came across these photos and they were just they have that life to them, and they have that expression mm -hmm. of her work and that gesture. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to see inside an artist's workshop is always exciting. Mm -hmm. I think that the spaces that we work as artists really tell a lot about our art making process and about who we are. Um, I think there's also this interesting idea of artists as collectors. So the yeah. things that we collect, the things that we keep in our lives and keep close mm -hmm. to us, like that dictates a lot about who we are and That's what so we so make so as mm -hmm. well. Um, oh, wow. That gorgeous. That's great. That's, can you give us a whole I'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see what's around. Um, so, it's a great presentation. Yeah, and I think that this, this image, you know, it speaks very much uh, to the depth that she really explored one form. I mean, the predominant form that she's known for is the house. That's really, uh, in all of really the leading scholarship about her, it's, it's the house, and that's, that's where she focused most of her attention. Um, but I think this is interesting too because it shows just this curiosity and this variety. So, you know, some artists, they tend to, like, they find a thing that works and they stay with it. Uh, that couldn't have been for Nina, even if she wanted it to be that way. It's constantly about exploration, constantly about curiosity, constantly about trying to express a similar idea in a new way. So those themes always running through the work. Um, and again, multiple firings on a lot of these things. Fired in different wood kilns again and again. Um, Nina had a small, has a small wood kiln. There's still a small wood kiln at her studio. Um, she only fired it once. She liked to fire with other people and be exposed. So for her, it was a way to learn too. You know, you learn from the way other people do things. Um, and always open to learning, always open to expanding her ideas. She would fire in different places with different people. Um, and didn't, you know, for an artist who's known for wood firing, it's kind of funny to not have your own kiln. Oh, not have your own kiln. Well, yeah, and to have not, her own wood kiln. She did, but she only fired it once. Yeah. She's such a groovier collaborative. Very yeah, much. The, this is like community. Yeah. If the house is the individual, it's community. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so moving through, this was actually, I put this piece in because I got to see her make it, which is oh. kind of exciting. Um, How big is it? It's one of the smaller houses, so six, eight inches. Okay. At most, yeah. Um, so I met Nina, I was an assistant for a workshop in Sweden. She was one of the artists who was invited. Um, I don't know, we, we had a couple of nice conversations early on. A really great memory of, we were trying to get... <laughs> 
trying to get to a grocery store to buy some wine and sausages or whatever, some things to contribute to a barbecue that we were gonna go to with uh, the rest of the group later that night. And the mission was, let's go to the grocery store, buy the things, go to the apartment where we're having the barbecue. We're in a town neither of us know, we're looking at the map, we plan out our route, we start going on it, and we start talking. And we're just kinda, oh, you know, this and that, and life, and ha ha ha, and then we kinda realize, like, oh, we're hopelessly lost. Let's locate ourselves on the map. <laughs> find ourselves on the map again, keep doing the same thing. So we're like totally late to this barbecue, but it's like this really great time to get to know one another. Mm -hmm. um, really great time to spend with one another. And throughout the rest of that uh, symposium, you know, I'd just kind of go and check in and see what she was doing every day. And oh, what are you working on? What's going on? Um, so yeah, this is one of the pieces she made there. A wood-fired house, two different types. Mm -hmm. um, this really lovely black clay. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny because she works very, though the clay is treated very rough, all of these things are quite light and thin. Mm -hmm. And I asked her about that and I was like, you know, why, like, why do you put the attention into making these thin? They don't necessarily read as that, like what's, what's the thing? And she's like, well, we had to pay for clay in school and I never wanted to spend the money. So, you know, that's like stuck with me the whole time. Mm -hmm. So she did get something from school at least, mm -hmm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of nice that they feel. It is. It feels it, good. Yeah, there's, there's something nice to that. Um, so I think Nina is an example of one of those artists who really was able to find a profound depth in a relatively small subject area. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that's a challenge as an artist is that you don't want to become a parody of yourself. You want to be constantly looking for new exploration. Your interests take you somewhere else. Um, but Nina had this really great way to kind of circle around similar ideas uh, while still finding new expression and new new things to talk about. Mm. It's another uh, later one. This is 2012. Um, also made at that symposium in Denmark. And she, she was funny because of all the artists that were there working, um, I don't know, as an artist at one of those events, like you, you tend to feel a little bit of pressure, like you're kind of performing, you want to, you want things to be right, you want things to be good, but that's not always art making, there's a lot of bad to get to the good. Mm -hmm. um, but Nino was working with just this calm that was so evident uh, that maybe other people, I don't at least remember them being as calm, but she was just kind of calm confidence and you could tell that it's, it's like she was having a conversation with an old friend and making her work. Shows mm. another little wood-fired guy, and again the scale on these things. That last one is maybe a little bit taller, maybe more nine or ten inches. But a lot of these kind of live in that four to six to eight inch range. Mm. This is actually porcelain. Oh, yeah, it looks like. It. Yeah, this is actually wood porcelain. Fire. Yeah, wood fired porcelain. I think we have some other oh, surfaces. I really like how you know it looks dirty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you, it's a, I mean, porcelain is such a uh, you know fine. Such a clean you know, material, yeah. Yeah, yeah but it looks something so, different. But something about the the contrast is mm -hmm. uh, it's so sexy. Yeah, mm -hmm. there, there's something quite nice to it. So this form is interesting. It starts to get a little bit, uh, a little bit at some things that she did with her larger fire sculptures that we're going to talk about later. Oh, yeah. A little bit in the construction, um, but this also this piece combines two of her forms. So you do have the house, but that top is a boat flipped upside down. Mm -hmm. So she would combine her interests too. Mm -hmm. So there was a series of houses with legs. So they're beginning mm -hmm. to take on more of the figure. Uh, houses and boats combined, churches and boats. So there was this kind of cross-pollination between forms as well. Oh. Yeah, these are really, uh, this is oh, the last work that she made. Oh, um, these are the last series wow. of work that she made. And these are really... That's what I was yeah, this is the last series of stuff yeah. that she made. Which is, that's always really interesting. Mm. Yeah. That's what, 20... These, she... 14, 15 years. So Nina was, um, 
she had had breast cancer early in her life, had a mastectomy, had treatment, uh, went back to normal life, and the cancer came up 15 years or so later in her bones. Um, so she, she was active. You know, we built a fire sculpture in 2015. Her participation was less than she would have wanted. Um, so this is, this work is like the last Whoa. big push of her making life. So this work, this stuff represents. And where is this work now? Uh, there these are some are of, these are really st stunning pieces. Yeah. And she I just started to explore that kind of moon like motif. Yeah. I had a, a, a beyond mm -hmm. that she was doing. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's the interesting thing with her work because it, it simultaneously looks backward and looks forward. And I think that's that's something really powerful when an yeah, artist. There's something really optimistic. Hmm. Hmm. Mm. You know, I, I was feeling that they were portals. Hmm. Mm. That's a good idea. Oh, yeah. 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 And I think oh. Nina was. Yeah, something airy about. Mm. Mm. You know, constantly interested in the metaphysical, mm -hmm. constantly interested mm -hmm. in spirituality. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, again, one of those early conversations I had with her. You know, as a young artist, you expect this well-known person who's worked with the material for a long time to be ready to jump into their art making and talking about what they do and future projects and what they have lined up. And our first conversation, she was like, you know, I don't know that I need to make anything anymore. I might be done. Yeah. And that was kind of the point where she was at her life. And I was like, well, what, what's, what's interesting you now? And she's like, you know, I'm thinking more about what's next. And that's what's I'm thinking beautiful. about spirituality. Yeah doing a lot of reading about Buddhism. And so that's that's more of where she was at that point. Um, not that making was totally out of her interest, but she'd, she'd done so much at that point. You, you see know? that in the sculpture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's there's just such this this confidence that I mean about her. I know. It's, What's this? It's unrestrained. These, again, the taller mm -hmm. ones, probably around 10 inches to a foot. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that... Uh, Nina's husband, Larry, said about her, and, and this has always stuck with me, he said, Nina rested fully within herself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very true mm -hmm. of who she was. She was very, it's almost like we were all just kind of spectators <laughs> in a way, and it wasn't a dismissive way, but she, she had her plan and she had her trajectory and like other things were gonna happen and she would adjust to them, but she, kind of set in a way and it's just going to kind of go that way. Um, and again, she's always, that being said, always open to new ideas, always open to change and to evolution, but she, she had a very real understanding of the world and her place in it, um, more than I think a lot of us do. Another one of those series of masterclasses, yeah, and so that's a nice thing too, working across Working across different temperatures, um, and you know, not not married to any one technique within ceramics, which I think is such a wide media anyway. And that yeah, was her thought: is like, well, like, why not? Why not try it all? Why not experience so Did she not end up really studying in the market? I mean, she has no formal out. education. Good for her. No formal education. That's amazing. Good for her. You know, and some of the best artists don't. You know, and mm -hmm. they just do it totally their own way. Mm -hmm. And that's the pine chest, and they do it from, mm. from the gut. Yeah. 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 And well, that's original. So They're not held back mm. by any mm. oh, that's formal constraint. Yeah. Nice. Um, so wow. this, Look at that. as you're driving uh, mm -hmm. out towards Nina's place, mm -hmm. this is the church that you see. You can get a really good line of sight for it before you get up close to it. Mm -hmm. um, this is the church. If you go just down in this image to the left of it, there's a little road that runs down, and that was the road that she lived on. Mm -hmm. oh, um, really? So it's she, at the top of every street, every time she left her house, wow. she saw this church. Mm -hmm. uh, she's actually buried at this church. Wow. Um, and you see, yeah. you see churches of this style, especially like that white and red motif um, and that stair step shape at the top, like that, 
that is a motif that is common in Denmark, but every church is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, but this one specifically, you know, this is from her yard. <laughs> you can oh, really? see, yeah, you know, stepping out. Uh, it's very, very, very impactful. And again, like her connection to the metaphysical, her connection to religion uh, in more of a curious way instead of like a necessarily a practitioner. Um, yeah, Den Denmark is funny too because it's, it is a secular country, uh, but you still have to pay taxes to the church. You can opt out of it. But then you're not allowed to be buried in the church. Wow. What, what religion is it? <coughs> believe. I mean, it's Protestant. Um, yeah. So it's. Yeah, it's very strong. It's very present, um, and it's interesting because that's it's one of those um, contrasting things in Denmark. That's really something. And you know, history of these things too, because this church is from the 1300s. Wow. So. Again, that like that sense of age, that sense of history, that sense of like, this unfolding mythology and story. Um, so these these color motifs came up a lot in her work. A lot of white use in her work. Um, she would always a white surface, but with some depth to it, and that's a lot of coming from this church architecture. Um, and so you would get in, and <laughs> we went to this uh, this concert at the church one night. We were very, maybe too fashionably late. We kind of walked in in the middle of it and made a little bit of a fool of ourselves, but that's fine. Um, they had uncovered all of these old uh, paintings and drawings mm. that had been washed over centuries ago wow. and started to uncover it. So again, that sense of history, that sense of something bigger. Um, mm. I don't know, she had this, this reverence for the iconography um, it's like, you know, I'm not on that team, but I really expect their work, or I really respect the work they've done this season, kind of thing. Um, so... I don't show it like that. No, that's a slightly different... That's a different... You're talking about this one. No. No, that no, one. No, no. We have something like that. You have one of the church ones. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And this is the church one, but cross mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. Okay, but we can have one that's black and white. Okay. Do you want me to bring it out? Yeah, maybe we can see that one later. Yeah. So, um, again, like these, there's a style of brown church that is specific to an area in Denmark called Bornholm. Oh, um, yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's these round churches. Yeah. Um, and Nina was, you know, she was interested in what caused people to believe when thinking about churches and trying to understand why someone would believe and why someone would like devote that much of their time and their life to it. Oh yeah, there it is. Oh, yeah. Do you think that's a different one? Or the that's different. That's different. That's different. I think it is different. Yeah, yeah. that's a different one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 But I think her exploration with this form too and turning that form upside down, you know, she just wants to wonder like, what is this made of? What is belief made of? What is a devotion to religion made of? Like what, what inside a person causes them to do that? Those are, those are questions she asked and oh, well, turn it upside down and look. Like that's how you figure out what something's made of. Turn it upside down and see what's in there. <laughs> Wow. Another more complex one in that series. Huh. So these all relate to churches on board. Yeah, the, the church. round church specifically is a form mm -hmm. really directly from the island of Bornholm. Sure. But again, like a white, red, huh. um, like those that color combination is a church connection. Another one of those really lovely studio shots. I love the gesture. And, Mm -hmm. That consideration that she has. In the mm -hmm. I, I have a, a quick question yeah. about uh, this kind of relationship between. So, was there much of a relationship between the figure and the church? I mean, just thinking about like a lot of medieval churches and basilicas and cathedrals mm -hmm. had were based on the shape of the body mm -hmm. and that kind of a profile. Did that add to the? I think it did, and just in general, I mean, she thought of, she thought of architecture as an embodiment of ego. 
so in that way too and wanting to understand groups of people by architecture if that makes sense mm -hmm. um, so again that idea of like oh you know there's all these people that go to church every week and seem really into it like what's going on in there <laughs> what what makes up those people that causes them to consider things this way um, so we'll talk a little bit about boat forms um, you know, any, I think we can identify to this very directly, living close to the water, uh, it's, it's part of you. When you live close to the sea, it becomes part of who you are. Uh, and there's all sorts of metaphor that you can dig out about rhythm and breathing and respiration, you know, all these things that nature gives us and that the sea gives us. Um, but the Danes, for being a very small country, uh, isolated by water, I mean, I guess connected to a continent if you want to go that way, but the Danes historically had this huge reach throughout the world, um, and still now, even for a country of five million, they have like 11 very, very large multinational corporations, and then a whole handful of smaller, large uh, multinational corporations, but the Danes had this way of reaching out to the world, and that was by boat. Um, that was how they explored, that's how they gathered information, understood new things. So that, understandably, worked its way into Nina's work. I mean, they had conquered and were in charge of a large region at their height, which yeah. included all of Scandinavia. Yeah, and yeah. Part of Denmark, and probably part of the New York. Yeah. So, yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, or, or some of the... Well, Iceland, Iceland and Greenland, right. Iceland is still technically are, yeah, Danish. Mm -hmm. uh, is it? It's just sort of barely removed, and Greenland is still owned by Denmark. Mm -hmm. And so really a, a huge impact for a small country, mm -hmm. if you think about that. Mm -hmm. yeah, those Vikings. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, you see, that's the thing about Denmark, too, is it's so, it's a country so steeped in history. Uh, they're always, always digging up new things from the Bronze Age, uh, uncovering new ships, uncovering all those new things. Very active. The country is very active with its archaeology and maintains a very close connection to it. Obviously, a lot of good funding uh, for cultural things. Um, enviable, I know. Um, I feel like we this piece was actually published in the New York Times. Maybe that's yeah. yeah it's, in, it's in the uh, kilns of Denmark. That maybe, maybe that's. Yeah, this is a very well published okay. piece. Um, yeah. So you see, again, combination yeah. of forms. So you know mm -hmm. what happens when a boat meets a house or a church tower. You know, however you want to think mm -hmm. of that architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then those also become legs. Mm -hmm. You know, you can you can combine all of these mm -hmm. themes into one thing. The dark clay, how, how is that? I'm, cu I'm just curious about the mm. color of that clay. I haven't seen that very much. That's probably an applied surface. Oh, okay. In fact, I believe it the, is. The, okay. Yeah, it's an applied surface. So, yeah. again, low Striking. fire work, yeah. Um, surface quality, I think, is what, you know, not even necessarily so much about texture, but that crusty, mm. crunchy mm -hmm. stuff appealed to her. <laughs> and this, um, I don't know, this kind of leads me to the next little part of this. Nina was a person that anyone that you talk to who knows her, anyone who had the chance to interact with her at all, always talks about the energy she had. And really, it was a fire that she had inside of her. Um, and that fire existed when she was old, but it started when she was young. Um, and those that drive and, I don't know, the energy that it takes to go out in the world, to bring people together, you know, that's, that's something special. And she always talked about energy as something that needs to be supported. So she was very big into artists supporting other artists, artists collaborating, artists sharing, artists working together, because again, that's so much the opposite of what she experienced in Denmark. She was very much removed. She was very much made to feel other. Um, so she really supported these ideas of inclusion and sharing and community and to, to a really large extent and again the energy that it takes to do these things it's mm -hmm. the reason that not everyone can run one of these places or have the idea to start something because it just takes so much from you um, can i ask you a question yeah um, so what's your opinion about how it is in denmark now from that time when it's time closed and all of this 
Denmark is probably much more open to the world, but I think that's maybe just the way the world is going, probably through the internet, okay. um, just as a way to to connect people. They're still, the Danes are tough. Um, so we have a friend who is originally from South Africa. She's been living in Denmark for the last 50 years. Obviously totally fluent in Danish. She sounds to me just like any other Dane talking. But even after 50 years, mm -hmm. there's still a sense of otherness. Mm -hmm. There's still a sense of removal. Mm -hmm. um, and that's... Tribal. Yeah, it, it is. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a, this is like a little bit of a tangent, but the spelling, you can get down to a spelling thing. So if you spell Denmark the way the most of the world spells Denmark, it's D-E-N-M-A-R-K. The Danes spell it D-A-N-M-A-R-K, Denmark. Oh, they do. They do. So there's a different spelling to it. Yeah, so you notice that spelling. Um, there is an artist collaborative group called Superflex, who is a group of diverse artists, performative, uh, who worked and spent a lot of time in Denmark. They received some hate mail. They made this really famous piece. Um, they received a piece of hate mail that said, if you don't like Denmark, fuck off, go home, get out. But the spelling of Denmark was the D-A-N-M-A-R-K. So it alludes to that sort of insularness. Um, so yeah, it's, I don't know. I wanted to ask a little more about that. Um, so I know that like the, um, the carpentry is like a craft guild, mm. and they have craft guilds. So is it that way also with clay? Is it like a that same kind of thing with an apprenticeship, and you have to learn how to do it a certain way? No. There's not as much of a sense of that. So there is, there are icons within the design world. So things based more in design. Um, like if you make furniture, like you can't make a chair in Denmark without talking about Arne Jakobsen. Like there's just no way. Um, so there are like these predominant figures in the field, but I don't think that there's as much of that. Um, carpentry and like other handy trades, and this is, you know, this is probably part of having a socialist society. Like it's very well paid work. Uh, it's very respected work. Um, but to get any kind of building or anything done in Denmark is astronomical, just because. Again, that guild system and people, carpenters mm -hmm. anyway, working through that. Uh, but no, not, not so much of a thing for clay. They have such a long uh, history of ceramics. There's a mm. lot of clay on the island, and they love ceramics. The and clay, though, is mostly from Bornholm. Mm. Oh, is it? Yeah. So there's actually not that much in like the entirety of Denmark. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah. I think it's a style thing. I don't know. I, when we saw the kilns of Denmark, that was the most impressive show. Mm. And, you know, all the work had such presence, whether mm. it was a vessel or whether it was mm. structure. And I thought that, uh, I mean, it seemed like uh, they, they had really good teachers there, and they mm. taught the students to be really into this. Nobody's work really looked alike than it does in the United States. But yeah. I could see how they would get trapped in that. Mm. Well, the design a little bit. You know, yeah. They might not have understood if what Nina was doing. Mm. I think one thing that's very interesting about Denmark uh, is that art design break. So here in the States we have this art craft break. And clay right. is in a weird space. Right. It's like continuously being defined. Have? But it's really hard to work in clay in this country without referencing craft, and you need to understand that tradition. And it's still a discussion we're having of like, what is the material? What is it capable of? That's not where things are in Denmark. Uh, it's more based on design, and objects of function lean more towards the design world. So design is through furniture <coughs> design, product design, uh, object design, all those things. It's It's got this really elevated status in society so you know here it's this weird like oh I make pots is that better or worse than making sculpture like I don't know how do I fit in what's the value you know so we ask all these questions and they just mm -hmm. they don't have that same conversation in Denmark mm -hmm. um, so I think the show that you guys had the Danish show uh, before Barbo's work 
You mean our big Danish show? Yeah, the big the, Danish show. Ours was a view from Denmark, and that followed. I mean, not so much on, but this was in that two, was this was 20, in 2002, 2003. Our show was in 2008. You guys had one more recently than that. And Lindemann. Oh, that show. Yeah. That was a totally artist, yeah. different show. That show was the younger the artists, artist, yeah. yeah. Of, I had gone to Denmark, mm. and I'd always, I knew of Ann Lindemann mm. from this and from William Hall, who was, you know, the chief official of the <coughs> Danish Friends of the United States for a long time. Mm. And I asked her to curate the show with younger artists, yeah. because those are some of the artists she championed. Yeah. So that was a neat show. Well, and I think that show was interesting, because that work was like, there was something in a good way that's just like a little off about yeah. all of the work if I remember correctly and it's it just goes to show you that like you have that ability to have that expression right. because you're not having that conversation about what the material can do right. just kind of like just do something with it. Right. Wow. it yeah. Evidence of contemporary artists in mm. yeah. um, So that leads me to the discussion of this Play today oh, symposium. Hey, 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 hey. Uh, so in 1990, Nina, uh, you know, back in Denmark, she had come back and is establishing herself there. And you know, it's that notion of community and that notion of interacting with other artists was still very present to her. So she decided, you know, let's organize a symposium. Let's put stuff together. Hmm. Called it Clay Today. So this was a group of artists from all over the world. There's some familiar US faces that you'll see there. Most notably, Jim Leedy there. Where's Jim Leedy? In the beret, oh, right under oh, Nina. Oh, yeah, I see him, yeah. And Don Wright's over oh, Don on the left. Oh, Don Wright. Oh, they both look like they're in their 40s. Yeah. Maybe they're 50s. Young men at that point. Yeah. Um, 60, I don't know. 30 yeah. to 90. Yeah. 30 to 90 is 60. Okay. Right. <laughs> Age is just a number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. I think it's interesting because we have like a concept of what was going on in uh, American ceramics at that time. And Who would? Yeah, I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And like Nina sort of touched these things. You know, she was really great friends with Don Wright's her whole life. Jim Lee Hughes, really great friend of hers as well. She knew Volkus. She knew like all these big names in the field that we wow. have. Yeah. Um, and she just kind of, you know, they thought she was great and she thought they were interesting and yeah. cool, let's work together. And again, this idea, like, Nina was never impressed by someone of, oh, you're the most famous artist from wherever. She's like, oh, that's cool. Like, what do you make? What do you do? Mm -hmm. um, so from this symposium, this group of artists coming together, uh, Nina there on the right building a piece. Um, group of artists coming together. And part of the result of this, you know, oh, we, we had a great time. Uh, I was in a city called Tomarup in Denmark uh, and the result of this was that we need to have a place in Denmark to show high quality ceramic and a place where artists from all over the world can come together and work together. So through again the energy that was generated from this symposium from Clay Today was established and this is all spearheaded and led by Nina. Now tell me where this is because I feel like I'm so this is the Ceramic Museum. Oh. It was named Grimmerhus and has right. recently been renamed. I will always call it Grimmerhus because I don't think they did a very creative name. It's called Clay. Oh, no. <laughs> I think they could have done a little bit more of a reach <laughs> for that name. Uh, but now, this beautiful building, what was yeah. once this like small kind of obscure museum is on like the state funding rolls. Hmm. It's gonna be there forever. Wow. Is it outside of Copenhagen? No, this is a little bit further away. It is on the same island, okay. the island of Silen. Um, but no, this is in a town called Middlefart. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the symposium play today, a lot of people together, a lot of energy. Uh, the result from that, this museum, Grimmerhus, as well as the residency center, which is still in operation today, uh, called Gulergo. So this was an old fruit farm. Uh, mm -hmm. They found this building uh, and were like, oh, this is perfect. It's this is great it, old. Is that close to Grimmer House? Uh, yeah. Again, like Denmark small. Yeah, like okay. An hour, Not that close. An hour probably by car away. Yeah. Um, 
So this is the residency center that's quite well known in the ceramics world. Um, so you can go, the studios are parallel to that building right across the street. They uh, remodeled the studios, I believe in 2013, uh, totally revamped them. Again, like totally funded by the state now. Uh, and it's really an exciting place because <coughs> This building and this space is like 15 minutes away from Nina's house, so she's totally isolated in this small farming community, but then she can go 15 minutes and interact with her friends and artists from all over the world. So it keeps up with those ideas of working with other people, learning from other people. Um, and then there to the right, uh, that is the last sculpture that Nina was part of the building of. Very appropriate, very appropriate tribute to have. Yeah. Wow. Um, so <laughs> this is kind of funny because uh, Faith, I know you've been there, um, so you will recognize this kiln, but it's changed a lot since then. So this is a kiln. Um, one of the other people in the states that Nina was very close to and very good friends with for her whole life is Fred Olson. Um, we know Fred for all of his magnificent kilns. This is a really unique kiln that he built there with this kind of dueling cross-draft chimney thing. And he can fire it better than anyone, of course, because he built it. Um, yeah. So, uh, again, th this place, Nina wanted this space where artists could come together, learn from one another, learn about places where people were from, and work together and grow from each other. So really, um, wood firing later became a focus for Nina. Um, today, Guliago has like, certainly one of the best selections of wood-fired kilns in Northern Europe. Um, and has become a destination for wood-fired ceramics. Uh, within Europe, they participated in 2014, uh, hosting, there's a European ceramic wood fire conference that uh, bounces around, it's been through several countries, and one of the recent iterations was in Denmark. Um, and one thing I think, I'll talk about this too briefly. Nina was interested in, again, like that lack of hierarchy and um, wanting to learn from what young people were doing and wanting to understand everyone's perspective on it. So one of the things that is unique to this place is twice a year for, is it six or eight weeks? Six weeks. Six weeks, yeah, these six week sessions, there's this um, thing called Project Network where young people out of, uh, I believe you can be no more than two years outside of an educational institution. You go for a residency, you meet artists from all over the world. Again, those ideas of sharing and growth from one another um, and supporting and encouraging the next generation of people who are to come. Um, it was cool too because it was a space where I think it wasn't anyone's space necessarily so this group can come to it and it's open it's open to be creative to do performance to do things that maybe wouldn't have fit somewhere else um, so you know you get relative strangers or people you've known for a couple of weeks and say oh well tonight you know after dinner we're gonna do a performance in the backyard you should come be a part of it and it's a place where those kind of things can happen, that creativity and freedom can exist. And again, like that's the stuff that feeds you, that's what keeps the energy going. Um, for Nina's 70th birthday, uh, one of the things that she thought was interesting, and I think that really speaks well to her impact around the world, she had this Matchbox show. So she invited hundreds of people from all over the world that she knew and said, make a piece that fits inside a matchbox and send mm. it to me. Oh. Mm. So you got to see like all of the diversity of what matches look like all over the yeah, world, which yeah. is pretty interesting. Um, and then, mm -hmm. you know, it's funny, my wife and I both made work and sent it to the show, and you have to reconsider your work of whatever scale it is, but to fit in this thing. Um, and just the, the variety and the depth and the notoriety of the artists that were represented, you, you just got a sense of mm. how massive her impact was in the world. Mm. And all of the people who... Can you name a few of that? Uh, like you and Akio Takamori had a really 
beautiful piece there. Um, yeah, they, there's just really work from all over the place. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. So, and these are people that Nina had met, you know, maybe she met them during a sculpture project, maybe she met them mm -hmm. somewhere along the way, but idea. still mm -hmm. maintaining, still maintaining that mm -hmm. connection. Sure. Um, so, so really part of what drove Nina to move around the world were uh, what became known as her fire sculptures, so these monumental sculptures. Uh, she worked in this way for about 25 years, mm -hmm. built these all over the world. Um, there's some interesting things, we don't have to dive too deeply into this, but there's some interesting things in Danish culture, uh, certainly pertaining to light, and one of those things is a midsummer celebration. Mm -hmm. uh, popular all over the world, I think countries who are located where they have less light in the winter, celebrate the light in the summer more. Mm -hmm. um, and one of, the, one of the things that maybe isn't so appropriate for now, but is part of the tradition, they would have this, the witch on the fire, mm -hmm. and the legend would say, you know, you burn the witch and then she flies down to Germany. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she'll, she'll, we'll still deal with her down there. Um, so I'm gonna, Back out of this for a second. So from now on, we're not going to be talking about the small works. We're going to be talking about Nina's fire sculptures. Yeah. Um, so this work, you know, thematically, a lot of, or all of these pieces were based around architecture, familiar in her small work. Um, but they dealt with it on a different scale. Um, <clears throat> these projects are also a great way to bring in that aspect of community and bringing people together because it takes a lot to build these projects. Um, so I'm going to show you guys a short five minute video of a project that was done, actually that last project done in Denmark at Guliago. Um And I think this video is pretty exciting too for just to show the emotion of the thing. Um, I so. hope uh, everybody's ready. It is going to be really hot, so running fast is better. Okay? Okay, so we are ready. For mig er huset arkitektur meget inspirerende. Og i mine øjne, skulpturen er de er bedste. Thank you. 
det der savsmuld og alt muligt. Fodskulpturen, det giver så en ny farve igen. Jamen sådan en, en åndfarve. Skulpturen ånder. That's why I got invited to join the team, because I could reach tall things. <laughs> That's like kind of a joke, but maybe not really. <laughs> yeah, the first the first product that I came to when we were doing that fiber wrapping bit. They're like, oh get the ladder, get the ladder. He's like, you guys I don't need a ladder. It's fine. Do you think that we could have the video and It's on her website. Yeah, so her, Nina's website is still maintained. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, we can play it also on our website yeah. too. For, yeah. So we can then, yeah. yeah, I can figure out where it is. I, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, these these large sculptures. There's something um, I think that Nina said about that work. That's I don't know. She, she always talked about it that way. That the sculpture is breathing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, like that anthropomorphization. Fun word. Um, yeah. That that idea of houses as people, as bodies, as, mm. you know, so even the language that she used to talk about these bigger things, um, that breathing, she would always talk about that. Mm. Um, so, first time I met Nina, uh, firing uh, during this symposium, this wood fire symposium, uh, she invited me to take part in a project in the States I think she was serious. I don't know that she was necessarily expecting that I would buy a plane ticket and show up, but I did. Uh, and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. And where was that project? That was in Cary, North Carolina. Uh, oh. And actually, my wife, the woman who is now her, I should say I'm her husband, um, <laughs> we met. So she had worked for Nina uh, for about five years at that point. Oh, before and, you met Nina. Yeah, before I met Nina. So. Um, Yes, she had been working for Nina for some time. I came to that project, and we took you a liking to one another. Yeah, the love of your life. yeah. Oh, well, yes. and it's actually it's. I didn't include the photo, um, so don't really need to make this about me. But there was this really touching moment during that last sculpture. So we have like really hard and fast rules during the firing. Of, like absolutely no alcohol, oh, absolutely really? no sleeping. Because people do that. <laughs> Uh, it's just, it's too important. We're firing this huge, you know, tons you of fire. Firing? Three days. Because okay. we don't dry the piece uh -huh. before we start really firing. Slow. We start raw. The first day yeah. is just drying. Yeah. Like 100 oh, degrees. Those, but some people must sleep in three days. You can't. You, you can't really, sleep. you really, you really days, well, we're, we go in shifts. shifts. We go in shifts. Yeah, so. six hour shifts. So if, when you're on shift, you can't sleep, you can't drink. Yeah. So we're mm -hmm. at this final project. Uh, we, my wife and I, Renata and I, were going to get married later that year, and Nina knew she was too sick to travel and wasn't going to be able to make it. We were married in Mexico. Um, she wasn't going to be able to make it. And her and the other, you saw her in the video, the woman, uh, she was wearing a brown sweater for a lot of time, a woman called Anne Charlotte Olson, who was an assistant for Nina for the longest time. Um, so Anne Charlotte and Nina kind of snuck away, like, oh, where are they? And then they came back out with a tray of champagne. Mm -hmm. 
uh, one of Larry's chairs, me and his husband Larry's chairs, and this big uh, like wooden heart that Nina had cut out and painted red. And we had a little ceremony, like right there, right in the middle of the fire. And it was just really touching. Yeah, it was a really brilliant thing. I mean, it was just a little toast and a little celebration. Mm -hmm. Me and Maranatha, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go over just kind of the basics of this process. Um, so try to explain it in the more general way. Um, so these pieces, these pieces are both a sculpture, I guess I should say they're all three, they're a sculpture, they're a performance, and they're a kiln. So built on the brick base, fired in place, it's about the finished work, but it's also about the performative aspect of building a large clay sculpture and firing it in place in a short amount of time. Um, you saw Nina, or I guess you could read the text on the screen, when she was talking a little bit about the genesis of this idea of, you know, I've been to all these places, I have these friends, how can I bring my kilns with me? So this new material of fiber was available, um, and it was a way to travel and make it work. So our basic building block, this U-shaped, structure. It's just this over and over and over and over and over again. Um, so this is all from a project in Taiwan. You can see things are already built up pretty significantly at this point. How did that U-shaped building block work? That's on the inside or something? Uh, how does it work? How or? Does it fit in? So you can see a little bit of that it, structure yeah. there at the top. So it's an alternating pattern. They one, run one direction, one layer, and the next direction they run the other layer. So they'll stack on top of each other like this. You can build a really strong double-walled construction. Um, this allows for several things. Uh, visually, it creates that pattern on the outside of the window, no window, window, no window pattern. Um, but those windows are aesthetic but also functional because when we're firing this thing, heat can move through the walls mm -hmm. and because it's a double walled space, heat can move up and down between the walls. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's just thermodynamic things, mm -hmm. the ability to move heat, um, but also to have something that's strong. Mm -hmm. And again, when you're building, you know, how do you, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Um, how do you build this massive thing? one building block or one piece at a time. Um, so these projects, you know, it's all about bringing a community together to see these things happening. Because it takes so much more than the ability of one person. Um, we would go work with assistants. So Nina would travel uh, originally with just her and her assistant, Anshalat. Um, that's Enchilat there. Um, so they traveled working together. Uh, Nina eventually brought on Renata, my wife, to work after a project in Mexico, um, and then later brought me on. So we would travel together, but also work with a group of assistants from the place where we were working. Um, so some images during the firing of this piece in Taiwan. So this is the end of the fire, and right before the unwrapping, you can see the crowd gathering. Um, these pieces start out slow in the firing, but then work their way up to this crescendo, to this really powerful, exciting moment. And then at that top temperature, you open it. So it's, it's funny because this is, this is not Raku firing, but this is Raku firing. Mm -hmm. But what temperature are you going to? We never know. <laughs> so, we talk, uh, so we use a pyrometer, what's called a pyrometer, to register heat, to measure, to measure heat. It's this digital display. We always call it the television. And as your mother always told you, you shouldn't watch too much television. It's bad for you. So at a certain point, we take it out. Uh, because it doesn't matter, really. It doesn't matter how far the clay is. So at 1,000 centigrade, we would take the pyrometer out and just fire based on feel at that point. And um, we're past any point of danger for problems with clay. So again, at the end, salt and sawdust thrown on uh, to create some surface effects, but also to help uh, modulate the cooling as this thing is exposed. And that's it the next morning.
Mm. And that's the piece as it sits. This is at the uh, Inga Museum in Taipei. Mm. How, uh, how many pieces? 25 pieces all around the world? 25 around the world. So, um, have, have uh, her, she unsuccessfully made one? There so was. They're not all still there. They're not all still there. Um, so the interesting thing with these projects is that we are intensely involved with them. Um, whenever you're doing this type of work, it is seven days a week, and it is like eight, 10, 12 hour days, depending on what needs to be done. I mean, we try to work at a pace that's reasonable. Um, Colby, you may still have some PTSD. Colby actually, uh, I was able to hire him as my assistant whenever we were finishing. The last project that Nina had designed uh, was for Purdue University in Indiana. She passed away a month before the start of that project. I ran that project and hired Colby as my assistant. Um, so Colby oh, wow. knows this, this process Colby. well. Is it, is it's that Colby. That guy. Yeah, okay. um, so Colby knows plenty about long days and hard work. You can attest to that. Um, and it's funny because you give yourself it's it's it is an obligation it is a burden at certain points because if it's we're so building it's, outside if it's we have a tent or some structure over it but if there's a storm mm -hmm. at three in the morning you have to wake up and go check it mm -hmm. if anything is wrong it's up to you so you have to deal with it if there's a problem if there's a material issue if there's anything it takes everything from you it consumes everything it takes massive amounts of material massive amounts of wood all of this planning, all of this focus, all of this concentration, but then whenever we're done, we walk away, and it's no longer ours. And that, that transition, it, it seems unnatural, but it, it's really when you're in it, and when you feel that, it's like, we've done our part, and now it's out there. Mm -hmm. um, and that, there's something really interesting about that. So there are some that still exist, um, there are some that have been washed away by floods. There are some that have been vandalized. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one in Mexico that someone kicked a hole inside of it. And it, I think the repair work is actually pretty interesting. It was repaired with cement and then painted bright orange. Oh, so, how cool. Why not? <laughs> yeah. And That's it, like an art. Uh, it evolves, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you have all someone else contribute to mm -hmm. the, the growth of it. So. Yeah, and again, that thing of like, it's, it's no longer ours. It's, it moves on. Yeah, so how does it weather? So this is this is the oldest piece that Nina in this photo is constructing here. This is in um, Australia, Golgong, Gol Gong, New South Wales. Um, so I mean, clay is a material; it can take it. It can take it, especially Australia is really good for this because they don't get the freeze thaw thing. They don't get as much snow, you know. So it's not. It's dry all the Yeah, so time. that changes yeah. things. So the, the environment does impact. It was done in 90, 1995. 95. That's a long time ago. Yeah. Wow, it's still there? Still, still there. Standing? Still standing. You went to Gogon recently. We did. So yeah. did you like go play, pay or your respect? We know? did. Wow, that must be sweet. It was really something. Um, wow. Yeah, that's wow. the. Were you there? Days. I love it. Were you there when it was made? Is that what you're saying? No, yeah. we were uh, there as invited oh, artists oh, nice. for. Was five five years years old. Old. I was five years old. Oh, you would be five years old. <laughs> I was a baby. Um, <laughs> so that you're not just twenty six, are you? Twenty eight. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That's why um, I said he was young. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's an age that just you know it could be yeah. it could expand. Yeah. Ambiguous, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're this is so Australian, so Aussie. So this clay actually, so rich and red. this, the land where this festival takes place, uh, Janet Mansfield is a name pretty right. popular or pretty right. well known in the ceramic field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Her and Nina were really great friends. I bet. Started this big festival, the Mansfield Enterprise now uh, run by her son and daughter-in-law Bernadette. Mm -hmm. Um, her son Neil and her daughter-in-law Bernadette, I should say. Um, it's quite expansive. The magazine Ceramics Art and Perception, they do the festival, uh, they have a gallery in Sydney. It's, I don't know how they have energy for all this stuff. Uh, this is on, and part of the festival takes place on the family's property, which is this cattle ranch outside of the small, what used to be a gold mining town called Gulgong. 
Uh, and this is clay that they have on the property. So that's an interesting thing with these projects too, is they are from the place too. I mean, it, it's not always clay dug directly out of the ground from that spot, but it is, you know, when we're in Germany, we work with German clays. When we're in North Carolina, mm. we work with beautiful North Carolina clay, you know, so. Um, so again, architecture, types of things that would have been seen. And this is another really early piece. Um, this is actually done at Guliaco, the residency center that she established this one. Uh, unfortunately, some uh, teenagers with fireworks destroyed it. Oh no! So, um, so these are really actually quite rare images of this thing in place. But this is early, early in the ideas, early in the making of these things. And you know, Nina, she was upset, obviously, to learn that something was broken. But she never wanted to go back to a piece. You know, she had done it. She was. It was the making. Yeah, and you can't you can't get back that moment anyway. Um, and again, like you do it, you're in it, and then you let go, and it's part of something else. It's part of the thing bigger than you. Um, it's another one in Copenhagen outside of the design school. This is in North Carolina at Appalachian State University in Boone. When did they do that? I think this was 2006. So maybe under Linder, yeah. I believe so. So again, just like various parts of the process that you guys are seeing. Finished piece. I believe that one is still there. Uh, this is in Sweden. Mm -hmm. Really lovely photo. Oh, it's really a stunning photo. It just depends. Um, so everything was commissioned. So an organization, and that's what was interesting about these because Nina, you know, she never said so she never really like asked to do one necessarily. She was always asked to do them. Mm -hmm. um, so funded by museums, universities, uh, like town cultural events. Uh -huh. um, for instance, we did a project in Dusseldorf in Germany that the entire town of Dusseldorf, or the city I should say, Dusseldorf is not a town. Um, the city of Dusseldorf had this uh, festival that was going on all sorts of words to define it, but like energy, fire, like those were things that they were thinking of during the festival. Um, I think translated was like reaching beyond tomorrow or something. Um, so a ceramic specific museum in conjunction with that festival was able to seek funding and then fund the project. So, you know. um, And so Maquette's we're part of the process for all this, but sometimes that relationship between Maquette and finished thing, uh, like how Nina would develop the designs for this. She'd be working in her studio and there would be small pieces, and I think she would have a sense whenever she made one that, of like, you know, th this could translate well, or there's something within this that would make sense at a different scale. Um, so that piece is the Maquette for, Organized, sorry for that. Mm -hmm. um, so you see that translation, but again, still like that movement. Those those pieces coming off, and that solid bit on the left, talk to this. Mm -hmm. So there's a conversation back and forth. So we would go with a maquette. Uh, Nina's husband Larry would make these great architectural drawings for us to work off of, um, and we would move from there. This is in Athens, Greece, for the uh, International Academy of Ceramics. I believe it was their 50th mm. celebration. This is in Hungary. This is in Mexico. Mm. This is a sculpture that later had a hole kicked in it. This is cool. This one's actually built on an island. It's fun, that's always something Nina was interested in, is building um, on islands. Um, so. Where's this? 
Uh, this is in a town called Jalapa. It's the capital of the state of Veracruz in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, so this is actually the town where my wife's family is from and the project that she, where she met Nina, Nina kind of took her as part of her team. Was she a play artist? She was. Uh, Renata had originally studied Italian literature at school. Um, there was a student strike during one of her early semesters of college. She left school where she was in Mexico City, went to Veracruz where her family was from and where her parents were living at that time, um, and enrolled in art school. So. Uh, this is in Korea, wanting to play with a more modular piece. Uh, Nina would include this slide. She kind of laugh and talk about this and think, oh, you know, that's so smart. He's carrying all of his bricks. He's <laughs> carrying all of his pieces, you know. Maybe that's what I should do. Maybe I should work with small pieces and build something, you know, make these things so that they can break apart and be transported easier. Um, she had the opportunity to do that at this festival in Aberystwyth, Wales. Um, it's a festival, I believe it's still being done it's pretty today. Festival. Yeah, it's not, I don't think it's every year. I think it's, it's probably on the yeah, some two-year rotation, something like that. Um, so she built this piece that it could be disassembled so that triangle fits on top and then a couple other segments in the body. Um, because after, it's funny, this festival, they build all these things and there's all this energy and people building kilns and sculptures and firing it, and then the next day they just clear the field. Whoa. It's all gone. Whoa. Take it with you if you can, or you're not going to see it again. Uh, this is in Brazil. This is in North Carolina. And this is, um, this photo is interesting because this guy uh, working here, Camille, working here at the slab roller uh, on the left side of the screen, he lived nearby where the project was. And we were just like walking by one day. He's like, what are you guys doing? I'm like, oh, we're building this sculpture. And he's like, oh, can I like, can I be a part of it? Can I help? So yeah, sure, you know, talk to him, he wants to be a part of it. And he just really loved to roll slabs. It's like his favorite thing. It's like, you yeah. want to roll slabs all day, Camille? Like, we will not stop you. <laughs> <laughs> and he loved it. But it was really interesting, too, because we, um, this is the first project where I took part of. Um, but he was from, or I should say is from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And he took us over to his house and, you know, we sat down and watched this uh, documentary. It's really depressing about, you know, taking rare earth metals and exploitation in the Congo. And um, so, but that, that was part of what was fascinating to me now about this project is that you got to take, you're giving people something, you're leaving something, but you get a little bit of Absolutely. the people, yeah. of those involved in the project. Is this structure temporary, what was built there? Yeah, that's just a tent to go around it. This is like a way overbuilt tent. This, Carrie's funny, um, talking again about like what you do with these things. This is a view from the top to see uh, kind of what's going on inside. Um, nice photo of Nina during the working. It's quite a large piece. Made a good deal of time for this one. Um, but it's quite funny because they go through and so there's no, as you can imagine, no small, <laughs> no small commitment of time or energy, but they decided as a town after spending all this money on the project that they didn't like where it was located and then spent like an obscene amount of money to have some engineer move it three blocks away because <laughs> they wanted to. It's like, that's their deal. Um, it's really funny after this project because we, there's usually some sort of at least in the States, like fire department presence. Mm -hmm. Nino was so excited at the end of the sculpture. She like, she was in the moment and wanted to be there, but she really wanted to get done so that we could go ride in the fire truck because the guys had promised her that we could. And I mean, you could obviously see she's just like beaming. Um, and we were going around and she was like, oh, it'd be great. You should turn on the sirens and honk the horn. And they're like, yeah, we can't really do that. Like you're not really supposed to. And she was just so, good with people and just so charmed she just kind of was like well yeah but except like this time right <laughs> and the guy was like yeah okay and like rips on the sirens and speeds down the road and Nina's just like totally into it it was great yeah. 
Now that is that piece finished. And so again, like exploration of a similar form again and again. I think that that's what's so powerful in some of this work. Uh, we went to Japan. This is one of Nina's favorite pieces. Uh, we were up in the mountains in a small tea growing area um, in a village of like 250 or 300 people. Um, now there is, this was for the first iteration of this festival, the um, Sasama Festival. Yeah. So an artist who I believe you guys have worked with, Shoza, Shoza Mishikawa. Mishikawa. Yeah. 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 Um, so he wanted to start this. It's in this town that, this village that's dying because there's no opportunity. So, you know, there's more people over 100 than there are under 25. So this is at the site of a boarding school that was closed. Um, they have this really interesting ceramic festival. Shoza has a lot of connections to Europe, so a lot of yes. European artists, especially French artists, come. Um, <laughs> the obligatory funny suit picture before we wrap five. Oh, <laughs> nasty work, but we do it. Um, and this was this was like a modest piece, but I don't know. We had such a great time in Japan, and um, they've been they respected it so much. I think that's what really stood out. They so appreciated it in a way that maybe other mm. people didn't. Mm. Um, and this one really has weathered quite nicely. It's uh, got this really beautiful like pink purple that's come out of so it's this pink purple gray blue white mix that's going on we had some really nice kaolin from korea for this one that was part of that circus oh. um, and it's formally i think it was one of the ones that nina really 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 felt proud of um, and that, again that material you wrap in is kaolin yeah it's um, ceramic fiber it's fun silica um, so again, like getting to stop by and have tea with people and see what's going on. And I think that was what was exciting for these, for Nina, for these projects too, is that she could be out in the world. She could. So is that, is that Nina and Larry? Yeah. So Renata, my wife on the left, oh. Nina, and then Larry over on the right. Larry was a riot in Japan. So funny. Did, does he go to all the firings? No, he doesn't go to all of them. I think that... <laughs> As anyone who is in a long-term partnership will know, sometimes you need space. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Nina going away for four to six weeks to build a sculpture sometimes was good. Um, and I mean, like, Larry, it's funny because he was there and he didn't really know what to do with himself. And he made really, really great friends with the guy who's a photographer there that they still, like, go back and forth. So, like, Larry, go hang out with your friend. <laughs> busy. Uh, this picture is, yeah, this is picture is kind of funny. So like this was our first connection to this area, actually. Um, this is where we first met Chris, who anyone in this region will know. Um, so that was, yeah, again, these things that were important to Nina because she could meet people that she would later interact with later in her career. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's a small world. Yeah, we had just taken, this is in... Tokyo. We had just taken the train and were incredibly confused walking out of the metro station in Tokyo because it's insane. Uh, and a very nice woman uh, told us, took us actually to where we were going. And wow. she was like, oh, we should see this temple on the way. Like, you gotta stop. Oh, do you want me to take a picture? Like, yeah, sure. Uh, this is in Dusseldorf. Hmm. This one was funny. We were building right along the Rhine. Uh, they were convinced they could move it. Um, did not work. So this piece was destroyed like three days after it was wow. finished. Um, yeah. Three days after it was finished. I don't know why they couldn't have found a way to keep it there, but they didn't. But that's part of that thing is that you do it, you move on, it's not yours. Um, definitely with site-specific works, you're always considering how things relate to the space that they're in, which I think is another part of why it's unfortunate to see these things get destroyed mm -hmm. because this, they were this case is ephemeral so it's gone yeah. yeah but they were i mean they were considered to be in that spot so mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to see one go for that reason because mm -hmm. you know that first day when we're laying out the space you know it's just 
constantly hemming and hawing. What about this angle? And look over there. And what's this? And what's that? And maybe we turn it three degrees, or maybe it moves six inches that way, or maybe we, you know. I um, mean, those those little details make sense because this, you can see a little bit with that bridge in the background, uh, mm -hmm. kind of that mirror. There was another bridge on the other side that it related to more directly, and then that tower faced this big. I think it was a big bank tower uh, right across the street from it. Mm -hmm. um, this is the firing of the last piece in 2015 in Denmark. Oh. So there we all are after too much pastry and hard work. Ah. In the last studio shot. I think that is a very well, important thing. We might have to take a minute so other people can have something to toast. Yeah, well, no, I think that's a good thing. Do we have any questions? Yeah. So, uh, so I will say her website is still active. There's a huge selection of small works, uh, further videos, further photos of all the fire sculpture projects, wow. CV, resume, all that stuff is up there. So well, please feel free to all. visit yeah, her website. And Are you doing any yeah. more you. of this or it's over? So we... <laughs> This was a discussion that we had with Nina. Um, we were able to be there. My, 